Welcome to um, the first Art History in Focus talk, um, everybody who's joining us. I'm very grateful that you've all logged on um, to, to listen into this, which for me is a, a great personal pleasure because it means that I get to talk to somebody that I, um, I spend a lot of time learning from and um, I try and interrupt and bug him as much as I can to learn a bit more, and that's Peter Sharder who is joining me for this, which is the first in, I hope, uh, a an ongoing series of Zoom conversations online, which will look at how we engage with works of art, how we, um, how we look at them in different contexts and what has an effect on how we look at those objects. Um, it's interesting for me because there, I, I'm a commercial gallerist. I work for Sam Fogg in London and uh, as a director at the gallery, and I've worked there for seven years. And we are a specialist in old master paintings, particularly medieval, um, and that is anything from the 13th to, through to the 16th century. And we work with paintings very regularly, and they often come to us with frames that are faulty, broken, damaged, or, um, or just, uh, not compatible with the paintings inside them. And so I've started over the last few years to try and interrogate how we look at paintings and pictures and how the frames can tell us uh, things about those images, those objects, and how they can sometimes impede or help us read the imagery within. Um, and so I've already started waffling but on, but I will now let my co-host introduce himself. Peter, please. I'm Peter Schade. I'm, I'm actually at the National Gallery. I'm the head of framing at the National Gallery, and I'm broadcasting from my office at the National Gallery. So occasionally you have, you'll get the um, announcements closing the gallery at this time of day, I'm afraid. Um, yes, we have been working and looking at frames with Matthew for a number of years. I've been at the National Gallery for 15 years. I've been working with picture frames um, for the last 30 years. I'm a trained woodcarver, but I come from an art historical background, family background and therefore have a kind of a, uh, um, an interest and a, and a long-standing interest in, in, in art historical aspects of, of picture frames, which actually art historians strangely have for almost a century sidelined or has been sidelined by, by academic art history. Um, there, were, there were several questions that, um, that made me think of, of, of organizing this event and they, they tend to be really about how, as, as, as you've said, um, how frames have been sidelined um, in, in, in scholarship, but also in how just the general public like me go into a, a, a gallery or a museum and look at a work of art and how we understand that work of art. And do we understand what we're looking at when we look at both it and the frame that houses it? And so there are a couple of questions that I've thought of to structure this uh, talk. And the first is what, just a very simple one, but as we'll see, has a very complex answer, what frames are and how they can function. I'd like also to ask the question of how they were considered or how they have been considered over time in, um, in, in relation to the pictures that they frame how they help read us, help us read the imagery that's inside and how they might be used to unify or create difference between multiple objects. And that will be a, a, a we'll use the wonderful uh, Titian exhibition currently on at the National Gallery and which has now thankfully been extended until the 17th of January next year as a case study really to interrogate that last point. So I should start now by saying, and I hope that this is all coming through to everyone okay, by asking the simple question, what is a frame? Um, Peter, you had some comments about this it, particular it's well frame. chosen. It is, it is what most people think of as, a, as an old master picture frame and was what until well into the second half of the 20th century was considered as, a, as an old master picture frame, um, which is a French 18th century frame because so many paintings that came to this country um, came via the big French collections of the 18th century. And because those collections were not just collections of paintings, they were entire interiors where the frames um, would, would uh, harmonize with 
fireplaces, with ormolu, with with um, furniture, with 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 the entire architectural surrounding. Um, so, so so taken out of that context, these 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 paintings and frames came came into this country, but because people were so used to seeing paintings in these frames, and we still have collections of the 19th century, like the Dutch Picture Gallery or the Wallace Collection, which largely remain in this style of, 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 of presentation and, and people um, are used to it and are probably fond of because many people's first encounter with real works of art is in this type of frame, mm -hmm. um, which is, these frames were never made to be particularly um, considerate of the subject inside the frame. They were made to, 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 to harmonize with, with the world outside and, and um, are not ideal for everything, but they are in the public mind. And this is one of really good quality. There are levels of, of, of machine reproduction and of lower quality and of regilded and, 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 and adjusted and regilded frames um, um, of far worse quality, which is the, the norm in most museums, um, then this really beautiful example. And so this is a type of frame that is typically put on a painting after the painting has been produced. This is a, a what's called a rebate frame where a canvas or a panel, um, paintings are obviously done on multiple um, materials, copper, stone sometimes. These could all be slotted into a frame like this, but I'm showing you this slide, which um, I wanted to include because actually it, 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 um, it chimes with my interests in early frames and we're going to slightly, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly um, hijacking um, the talk at this point just to look at my interests, which tend to be in Northern Europe. And in talk like this has to be focused on something quite narrow because the field of framing is, is vast and as we, as we uh, discovered in, in, in the run up to this, that yeah. if you try to include too many interesting um, areas, it, it just becomes um, um, unmanageable. So I think this is a very good idea. Also, it's chronologically at the beginning of the story, really. So what we're looking at here are the four main types of frame construction. And I won't dwell on this too long, but it's just to show people that actually frames are much more complex than we initially think about when we walk into a room and see something in one. The one on the left, number one, shows it's, it's what's called an integral frame where the, the in this case, the panel and the, a wooden panel and the frame are all carved out of the same piece of timber. So um, you, this is a, a, a very, this has a positive benefit in being um, the most structurally integral, hence integral frame, type of framing device. And this is um, actually often indistinguishable from other types of frames, so numbers two and three here, applied and engaged frames, can, in some instances, as with applied frames, pieces of molding, carved molding, are applied and here doweled or nailed onto the panel. Um, and in, with the engaged frame, they are locked into place around it. And again, often with dowels and nails. And if you paint or gild over the interstice between the join between the, the panel and the applied or engaged element, it can often look like an integral frame, can't it? That it's, it's actually what you're, if it's, it's only when they crack and warp or, or move apart that you start to see uh, sometimes. Or I think, I think the, 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 the distinction between the, integral applied and the engaged frames, um, the, the integral and applied frame are completely indistinguishable because that's just whatever was the most, and we'll come to that as a practical example, whatever was the most um, sensible way of producing something. Um, whereas uh, th there's a difference between an applied and engaged frame. An engaged frame, the panel is made out of a completely separate piece of wood that's just either slotted or sometimes down, but mostly um, with some freedom of movement inside a, a, a rebate as, as shown there. And then but the all last, these, yeah. sorry, all the first three frames are really um, number one to three really stop um, being used in about 1520 and then, and then the rebate frame is what what was common after that. And rebate frames have the ability of being easily removable. I think the, the, the most quickly removable of them all. 
Um, and yet we will see later that actually it's some of the other types of frame that may have suffered the most over time um, in places. Um, I'm moving on quickly because I want um, to uh, show everybody that in the, in the later Middle Ages and the early Renaissance, particularly in Northern Europe, frames and paintings were made together, that the, that the, pa that the frame was constructed as part of the panel preparing or panel making process. And so as we can see here with this wonderful Nicholas Manuel Deutsch uh, painting in Bern, you can see that St. Luke who's painting the Virgin is doing so on a, on a prepared panel that is already framed. And this was the norm. What we think of today where a painter produces a painting in their studio and then frames it was not, it's just fundamentally not how, how paintings tended to be made at this date, at this early date especially gold ground paintings, they would have actually been gilded, frame and background would have been gilded before the painter started painting. Absolutely. And it's such a wonderful image because it also shows all the accoutrements of the painter in his studio, with his assistant behind having to grind all the pigment. And possibly even part of the frame re also ready to be painted because that's just yeah. white, which would be very unusual. So, so one would think that that was ready for a marbling or a, an inscription or something. And we will see how that occurs here with Van Eyck, who um, produces some of the most interesting, uh, dynamic and significant frames, meaningful frames as part of his paintings of, of, of any painter of this period. He, he routinely thinks about frames as integral aspects, not, so sorry, pun intended there, but as integral com kind of um, contributors to the significance and meaning of the painting. Here, for instance, with the wonderful um, self-portrait, well, possibly a self-portrait at the National Gallery, it is framed in a combination of applied and integral framing, so the two side members, if I'm saying this correctly, Peter, I hope you'll correct me if, I, if I get it wrong. It's all correct, I'm, I'm listening. <laughs> I feel like I'm at a job interview. So the two side members are integrally carved as part of the panel that the painting is painted on, and the upper and lower members are applied. But there is a reason for doing this, isn't there, Peter? Yeah, so you can, you can see that from the front as well with the, with the dowels. If you look at the, at the image, um, you can see three dowels um, at the front and the bottom is slightly less visible, but you can see dowels at the um, top and bottom and not at the sides. Yes. Um, the reason is simply because these moldings are very fine for, 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 for the date. Many other frames at that time um, were much more, um, much rougher. And, 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 and this is a really refined, very articulate, very shallow molding um, that, that could only be um, sensibly produced with, with molding planes and the molding planes need to, they can't run into corners, they need to have, need to have a long run so you can run the sides also that go with the grain whereas if you, if you, if you cut, cut the top and bottom out of cross grain that would be impossible to plane, you could probably carve it very complicated, it would be laborious and, and it would probably never look as straight and as kind of neat and sharp as, as these moldings. And this is really is, is already the, the greatest frame we have at the National Gallery. It is, it is, it is a marvel in preservation. It's got original gilding um, that has never been substantially restored or cleaned, which is just really um, in, in what, what I would consider absolutely perfect state of preservation. I'm going to move on here because this is <laughs> this is another example of a of a Van Eyck painting. This is in uh, Dresden. It's called the Dresden Triptych, uh, painted in 1437. And I'm showing this to everyone because it shows the painting from the top. We're we're looking at it from the top, which is not a, a, a an angle that we'd usually be able to look at this painting from and it's in its closed state, but you can see here that there are both applied and engaged elements being used on the same object. And so it, panel and frame makers would be working with multiple um, techniques to achieve the, the correct moldings and, and also the most structurally sound moldings, I guess. And we get a glimpse of a, of a completely different frame. And Jan van Eyck, 
I think about a third of Jan van Eyck's paintings have retained their original frames, which is really remarkable, but, but none of them are alike. They're all hugely inventive and, and, and very um, um, particular, and I think with, with profound influence on later generations. I, I'm, we included this, Peter, this is thanks to you, actually, I had, um, I, I'd, I'd let this slip from my mind, but this is such an important frame for many reasons, because it, it, it shows just how complex frames were at this period, and how they continue to baffle us, and it's mainly because there are, it, there is a debate around this object, isn't there, about whether the the wings and the um, the outer section of the central panels frame are original early period additions or even in the modern period. Yes, I think at the moment the the the, the, um, the official um, National Gallery account is that that it was put together by a Spanish um, um, by, by a Spanish painting dealer in the 19th century. Um, so the inner, the innermost frame, so the inner, it's got like two sills, two window sills, if you look at it, and, and the inner part and the inner molding um, right next to the Virgin Child, that is an engaged frame. Um, and the panel cannot be taken out of that, but it's set in an outer frame um, of the same period, with, with the same quality gilding, um, even with, uh, with parts of the molding sharing the same quality. And when you look at the back of this, and unfortunately I don't have an image of that, um, when you look at the back of it, it fits exactly in height and width, but also exactly in depth. It's got exactly the same construction and the same quality of oak and the same coloring of oak. And I've been finding frames for the National Gallery at quite a rate for the last 15 years. And, and I would consider something like that, really it's, 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 it's it, for that to have happened Randomly in the 19th century, I think it's it's it's, it's um, very unlikely or, or almost impossible. Well, and, and for and for such an for two objects that fit so perfectly together, that is a, a would be a, a fluke of coincidence. In it? height and width, but also in depth and in coloring from the back, hmm. uh, I, I think it's well, it's a very interesting object altogether, and it's always shown. In, in one piece. Actually, I looked at it partly with the idea of if it's not the original frame, maybe we could use it for something else and have the painting <laughs> just just in its original state. But but that um, that that here not that interesting. So this, I it, we were talking about this over the last few days. In fact, about whether objects could have been made with one intention in mind and adapted very quickly afterwards for another function or for the changing demands of a patron, for instance. And, and there are other examples where that does seem to have been the case. So I wonder if this could be one such example. A, a small painting like this would have been a private commission, something that somebody would have wanted to have for personal usage and would not be um, something for representation. Therefore, one would think people being idiosyncratic that they would ask for a prayer, in this case, a prayer that, that, that is supposed to be said with an image of the Virgin in sorrow, um, maybe with a different image of the Virgin just because it was a whim. Um, to me, that seems a, a possible explanation. And I've included, I've purposefully tried to make the caption as long as possible here, just to show everybody that when we're even talking about the dimensions of a, of a painting in its frame, there are radically different sets of dimensions that could be Wonderful. could be used. You know that. Um, how do we classify the size of a painting? Is it just the painted surface? Is it including a frame? In this case, that it has original elements, we must surely take into account the whole object, and that is something um, that carries through to even the largest scale. This these two paintings um, that are in Brussels by Derek Bouts, painted um, for the, the Chamber of Aldermen in, in Leuven, is a really fantastic example of um, what seems to be a largely original applied frame that is used for spatial and um, architectural effect 
and the painting within the, the frame absolutely uh, references the frame itself in a very clever way, particularly on the right hand panel where we've zoomed in here on the right. It's wonderful. Yeah. Sorry, and at that scale, it's, it, it really is almost the size of a real doorway. Absolutely. Over three meters. It's, it's astonishing. And, and almost looking at the, especially the, 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 the right hand panel in your, in your, um, uh, um, the ordeal version. version. Yeah. Um, it almost gives you vertigo to see the, 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 the that narrowing of, of the perspective. And it's, it's a really amazing, um, and, and, and it relates to so many other, so many painters painted paintings to, to rival sculpture. This is also an element in this by having a, a sculptural frame repeated, almost more sculptural inside the painting. Um, this happens very, I think this happened more often than we have evidence for surviving today, but it happens both sides of the Alps. And this is one of your examples, Peter, that I thought was so, I mean, it perfectly illustrates this. I, I'd love, I'd just going to leave you to talk about this. I know, this, this is really, when this is the most, um, when there are other um, paintings of, of, of this period of, in, in Atlantica frames, that relate where, where the space relates um, to the outer frame, like the, the, the Bellinia Frari Church or Mantegna and Zeno altarpiece. Um, but this is the one where the frame and the painting are co in complete unison. Mostly they are just columns that somehow are repeated with different columns in the painting or the space. But this, everything aligns, the covering of the ceiling, the exact replication of the, of the capitals, the space is, 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 is perfectly created and it makes sense in San Jobe. This was originally for San Jobe because when you go into the church on the left-hand side, you have actual substantial chapels, but on the right-hand side, there isn't room, there's just a wall. And, and, and I think the Bellini was the first kind of non-chapel on the right-hand side, but created this kind of complete space to, I think, to, to complement um, that, particular situation in the church. And, and now the painting has been removed to the academia in, in, in Venice and it's shown without frame. And I think it's, it's really in that state, just a fragment and, and doesn't really convey any of the magic that, that, that Bellini intended. That's really interesting to hear you say, to, to think about a painting out of the context of its original frame as just a fragment. And we'd so rarely think in this way, but I think it's really important to do so. And I, I loved what you said, actually, Peter, a couple of days ago about um, uh, frames being a foil for the suggestion of space and, and, and depth and physicality. And I think there's nowhere clearer than in that bounce and in the Bellini San Giove piece here. And you were mentioning here about the capitals being perfect uh, renditions of the carved uh, pilaster capitals of, of its frame as well, yeah. which ties them, ties the two in perfectly, doesn't it? Even down, it would seem almost to the play of light on their surfaces. And beautiful how the moldings don't, don't completely line up, but line up visually. Yes. Kind of allow for that. It's, it's, it's very, very clever and, 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 and really profoundly important for that, for that painting to be shown in this context. Mm. And so um, I'm hijacking again to go back to the north where I feel much more at home. Um, and this one is an example of a diptych, one of perhaps the, the best um, uh, examples of a, of a Netherlandish uh, late 15th century diptych in its still preserved in its original frame. And there has, I think, been some alteration to the frame, but not to the gilded surface and not to the illusory painting on, on the lower sill of the frame. So this is called a sill frame, um, if I'm correct, Peter, because it has this, this uh, sloped lower uh, yeah, member. Like, like a window sill, I think it's the idea, the rain sill. Um, and it, so it, it, it has an architectural context, but it, it's almost nowhere more apparent than in this memling, where the lower sill of the picture of, of the frame almost continues the space that is then portrayed within the painting covered by this fabulous carpet and the cushion that Christ is sitting on, on the left-hand panel. And it really is the left-hand panel um, and its frame that are 
the bearers of meaning here because not only does the cushion uh, um, pool a shadow beneath it onto the gilded surface in this beautiful, delicate, stippled shading, but also at that lower right hand edge, almost being um, pointed to by the straight leg of Christ, and is this the, little pool of the draperies. That's, it's more common for drapery to, to, to enter onto, onto sill frames. Um, but the, the, that, that stippled shadow that you, that, you, that you mentioned is really the most astonishing and the most, that has the most vivid effect on the space that way you look at the foot, it really looks as if it's hovering above the writing because of that shadow. It's, it, that, that is a, a really astonishing um, because it's so subtle. So it's also, it's, it's, ha it's got this architectural significance, but it's also drawing us into the imagery in a symbolic manner, this, this sense of proximity. There is a lintel, there is a sill here. We're not allowed to cross it physically, but there is the suggestion that through contemplation with, with Memling's diptych, we might be able to transgress that boundary in some capacity, I think. And I, I draw on this example as well, because I think um, it, this is a, a perfect example of where the frame, I think, helps to connect us symbolically with the object that's being referred to, even though we don't really think of it in, in, in that way now, in the, in the way it's displayed, in the way it's lit, behind glass in a museum context. This is in the Louvre in Paris. And this is a, a wonderful, very small um, a, a round, a, a tondo or round panel, which has an integrally carved frame on one side only. And on what is considered the back, um, the, uh, on the right of the screen here, against this blood red background is an image of the crown of thorns and the three nails that nailed Christ to the cross. And this is, is talked about now, um, in art history as an example of uh, an object that was made for manipulation, that it would be moved in the hands turned and that there would be this sudden shock for the viewer and the holder to look at the crown of thorns. They've, they've, they've been focusing on this beautiful, sorrowful image on the front against this really lavishly tooled background of gold. And then they turn over to a much more visceral image, a much more immediate and shocking image. But I think even there, they would have had a play with the frame because on the left, if you can see, there is a, a continuous band of rubbing that has exposed this red bowl underlayer that, was, uh, that supported the gilding above on the central molding of the frame. Now, I don't think that's a coincidence because actually this frame r rises to a, a kind of cusped um, rounded peak at, the at, at this point in a, in a single band. So it, it would have felt if for the viewer and the handler, the lucky medieval handler who owned this, as they turned it over and held it in their hands, not only was the frame an aid to gripping, but it, was, it would also have felt with this slight cusped inner molding and, and the, the rounded top to it, as if maybe they were holding the vine of the crown of thorns, the actual branch itself, perhaps. There was, a, I think, a tangible thing um, to it that, that connected us to the imagery on the back. And this is pure supposition for me, but it would be bought, it perhaps borne out by the, uh, the physical evidence of having obviously been rotated multiple times and handled with the bowl showing through after a continuous wear. It is quite a particular molding and the way, the way it's, clearly been handled, it is visible that it's been handled all the way around. So it's something that has been turned over and not just in one direction, but been held in the hand and, 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 and um, all the way around. Yes. Maybe. And I think, so we're starting to build a picture here, I think of how, how important, how fundamental frames were to um, the imagery that they contained. And I think that's also, uh, evidenced by what is quite a rare um, example of a drawn copy of a lost painting by Van Eyck. And I hope that uh, everyone's still with me here. Um, this is a drawing in Lisbon and it, it's a rarely exhibited drawing, but it was actually one of the little unsung heroes and highlights of the recent Van Eyck exhibition um, in Ghent. And 
I, I draw on this because I think um, the copyist clearly considered the frame and its decoration as an integral and fundamental contributor to the meaning of the painting itself and not just the image in the frame. This includes an inscription, um, emblems that relate to the Dukes of Burgundy. And it, I think there's something really important here that it's telling us something important about how frames were viewed at the time. It's almost questionable. The frame's almost too, it's almost too massive when we think that it might, the frame might have might have not been quite as big, but probably had that message and, and, and the, 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 the person copying it over or re-emphasized that quite clearly. But it almost looks like... Or, or, and it's possible that they increased it, uh, yeah. they enlarged that, that central band to increase the legibility of the inscription. Yeah. Um, with it's, it's a, a lot of these thoughts are conjectural, but I, I've, I'm showing this because um, it just goes to show how important frames were. This is an example of a rather wonderful virgin and child painting at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, which has lost its original frame. And you can clearly see that from the scars that are left on all four sides of the, the panel, where the painted surface stops abruptly. This would have been locked into either an applied or an engaged frame. Looks like an applied frame because you can see nail holes or something, nail or, or um, dowel markings all the way around. So I think it was an engaged frame, an applied frame. And um, I think I, I, I slightly went down a rabbit hole um, with this topic and I'm really grateful that you're um, humoring me about it, Peter. But this is an example of, a, of, of going back to my favorites, Memling again, this is in Boston at the Museum of Fine Arts. And I'm showing you two images, one um, taken by a visitor to the museum on the right, but the other on the left is the museum's primary image. It's the one that you typically see when you search on Google for it. It's the one that you see on the museum's website. And here is another um, instance here. This is me just taking screen grabs from the, from the website of the, the museum. And it shows as its primary image and the only one you're allowed to download actually, um, the painting without its frame. And yet its frame is original. The, the frame is dated and <laughs> it becomes so important when you consider the action that Christ has in it. Without its frame, the Christ's fingertips seem lost. Um, they have no physical purpose, no, no function here. They're just sitting at the bottom of the painting. But as soon as you put it into its sill frame, or rather as soon as you stop divorcing it from its sill frame, you see that actually he is standing at a, the, just the other side of a parapet or a wall and he is inviting this conversation about physical proximity through an architectural surround with us. It's, it's a beautiful beautiful um, comparison because you can see how the frame helps to order the space it's not that, that it, 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 but in, on the left hand side everything shoots forward so the fingers both hands are kind of equally forward and the face everything seems to come right to the front whereas yes. The frame and that and possibly the reflection on the sill brings the hand resting on the sill in front of the hand of, 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 of the raised hand, hand and and again creates the space for the body and, and, and the head to be further back so weirdly it doesn't it doesn't push the christ forward but it orders the the, the relationship of hands and body and face to my mind that's a really important point and um, it's continued, I think, with an example that, that you drew my attention to. Um, here, this, uh, this portrait of Bishop Tommaso Negri by Lorenzo Lotto, completed in the late 1520s. Again, this is me searching it on Google on the left-hand side, seeing an image of a painting divorced from any kind of frame. And on the right, an image of it in uh, the recent, um, uh, in a recent monograph on Lotto, again without its frame which yes, I, that's, that's actually the exhibition catalogue that was accompanying um, the Lotto exhibition at the National Gallery and, and the Prado um, about a year and a half or two years ago yeah. um, 
but significantly the painting has, has got its original frame. And it, even, it is described <laughs> in the catalogue as, as retaining its original frame. So it wasn't unknown to the authors of the catalogue, but still it wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't depicted. So I'm sorry, I had to put this in because you can even order a print of it with a fictive yeah. frame around it to simulate how it'll look in your wonderful loft apartment. But none of these images show that, as you said, it's got its original frame. Why we continue to divorce objects from their frames. And in, in this case, it's almost more extraordinary than a Jan van Eyck or a Memling, because no other paintings of this type, not even not just by Lotto, but no other Renaissance portraits of this quality of the 1520s, when frames have became uh, movable. I can't, cannot think of another portrait of quality that has retained its original frame. And in this case, a frame that has the, the, the possibility um, for a cover, to, which you can see on the, on the photograph on the right, um, which is taken at an angle, you can see there's a, a space um, for a cover that, was, that, was, um, uh, that could be slid in front of the painting. And there, there are, there's a, 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 a painting by Dürer at the at the um, uh, at the Gemälde Gallery in Berlin that has got a similar um, uh, space and has actually still got the cover. But in the Dürer example, it's it's just a coat of arms, a Holzschuh portrait. Um, whereas we know from from lot of paintings that many that he often we know from 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 Lotto's own inventory that he often painted covers for paintings um and but none of those frames have survived uh and this is really something extraordinary to my mind one of the very few Italian um paintings of this period that has retained its original frame and also notably a walnut frame which mm -hmm. partly explains why these frames would have been removed when the paintings became collectible and were collected in large um, princely collections in Italy in the 17th century and then in France in the 18th century, there was there would have always been a huge amount of pressure to, to, to change a wooden frame for a golden frame since everything else would have been framed golden. Therefore, very few walnut frames have, have, have come to us even in the 16th century. If you, if you, if you read through inventories about a third, a third or a half of the paintings were in part, partially or entirely wooden frames. So um, you took this to a, a hypothetical conclusion, didn't you, with um, another example by Lotto himself here? Yeah, at, at the exhibition we had, we had both a painting from a, a portrait um, from, from, from Capodimonte in, 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 in Naples and cover, which is now in Washington. And they were brought together for the exhibition, um, and 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 I thought it would be interesting to copy the Bishop Negri frame with with the with the slot with the uh, possibility for, for, for starting cover for the um, for the, for that portrait with its cover with, with existing cover just to see what just to bring something I I, I actually because I, it took me a while to 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 make it. I, I, I didn't actually make it in time for to, to look at it or to show it in the exhibition that was, it was finished just just after but it's but I find if what happens to the cover and the painting and the relationship of both and to to just the experience of viewing it is, is really profound and, and interesting and and and, and um, it kind of invigorates the whole the whole um, both paintings so you have the cover an allegorical scene where it, it's an allegorical scene where on the right hand side you have a, um, a badly uh, a, a wasted life with a drunken state, a shipwreck in the background, it's difficult to see in this, um, a spilled milk, spilled wine, um, just 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 a, a basically a, a, a life badly spent. Mm -hmm. And then in the middle you have an ancient tree with a new branch coming out of it and the coat of arms of, of, of the sitter um, lent against the tree. So that's clearly his family, an ancient family, and he must be the, 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 the living branch of it. And then on the left-hand side, you have a putu picking up instruments of learning, of, um, um, mathematical instruments and, and musical instruments, 
and then another put of tiny in this picture, you can hardly see it, climbing this, this mountain and climbing, the, uh, reaching the heights of, of accomplishment through learning and, and hard work. And, and that is kind of obvious when you look at the, at the, at, at the, as, as this are, at this Aragonca scene. But what happens when you draw it aside, and maybe Matthew can um, activate the, the drawing aside, maybe, and, and pause halfway if you can. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so, so as you draw, what happens is as you draw away the, the that's that's my personal interpretation of it. Which I, but I think it makes complete sense. As you draw away the bad life, and the moment that you only have the new branch of the tree, maybe another five centimeters oh, to the right. Sorry, sorry. I'm going to try and do it back. I'm really sorry about that. Yeah. It's a one. Um, so as you draw draw it open. And you come to the point, maybe there, where you, when you can actually see him coming out of, on the other side, is when you only have the well spent life, and actually, his shoulder forms a unity with with the mountain, of, um, with with that mythical mountain of achievement, of knowledge, of learning, and 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 even the the paleness of the skin and the paleness of the of the of the clouds mm. really. Um, um, come together and, and actually in, in reality, because I was very keen to show, which was visible in the exhibition, to show the, 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 the curtain in the background, which has got blue sky painted above it, um, which is lost in the current frame and, 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 and gallery conditions mm. at the moment. Um, so I was so keen to show that, that I moved, in the, 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 the prints I had were in quite the right size. So I moved the, 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 the portrait down a little bit, actually cut off a finger and a half of his hand, so actually, the relation would have been even more. I think he would. You should sit slightly higher, um, and 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 the shoulder would be even more kind of obviously formed mm. by that mountain. So if you draw it all the way out, um, I'm sure if I can, I'm going to try. Yeah. Then, then you have him himself, and I think it, it becomes it's an animated spectacle, and it's both humorous and really serious. And and yeah. and it's it's he lays he lays claim to to this well-spent life and, and, and the achievement, but in a way that's also lighthearted and, and mm -hmm. you just see something that you could show off even without comment and everybody would have understood um, what it meant. And maybe there's a shield of Medusa hanging on the tree, which has probably got um, some other meaning. Um, so it's full of clever and, 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 and beautiful uh, meaning. So often when people see frames with shutters, the, the, the conclusion is that oh, there must have been a naked lady behind that was then sh not shown. To, it's always there's always some, some very kind of, yeah. it's always a very um, uh, flat and, and 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 profane explanation. Whereas this, I think, is just just makes it rich and, and beautiful and interesting. And um, this this idea of physical manipulation, and I'm I'm watching the time because we've got so much that's really great to get to, and I don't want to have to skip through it at the end. So I'm I'm also taking pity on everybody who's listening to us, who's probably already desperate for a gin and tonic. But I am going to move on to the the next couple of slides because thinking about physical manipulation, it occurs both in Trompe-l'oeil. So for instance, these two paintings, one by Rembrandt and another. Um, supposedly a, a collaborative commission between Adrian van der Spelt and Frans van Mieris, um, both working in the Netherlands in, in the 1650s, where you have examples of um, revealing, concealing, and, and actually um, a, a, a physical engagement, a visual and physical engagement with, with the types of devices that can be used to frame imagery. And this is also borne out in evidence that we have from frames themselves. So for instance, this Maria van Osterwijk, which was recently acquired by the Joslin Museum um, in Omaha uh, from a London Art Week gallery, uh, Ben Elwes, um, has is one of perhaps fewer than a handful of, um, of, of late 17th century Dutch frames that have uh, original curtain rails um, in, in integrated into the frame, um, and it seems like it's original to the painting, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You do you do come across frames with with with, with um, the the holders of railings quite often, very rarely with railings, but quite often not not terribly common, but that's more common. But that one of those 
frames and survive on its original painting. That's mm -hmm. very rare And so we have it here in the 17th century, but it in fact happens earlier, doesn't it? This is an example of a Bellini that you've reframed for the National Gallery, Peter, where actually it's got quite an interesting story to the frame. Yes, well, th these are, of course, of a different category because these are just, that's what I do um, or try to do at the gallery. I try to find antique frames that somehow um, work better than the frames that maybe we have um, on paintings. And in this case, a very plain, beautiful, early 16th century cassette frame. But coincidentally, with an attachment, and you, from this view, it's hard to see, yeah, but with an attachment for um, a, a curtain rail, which is fairly common. You can see it in, in, in Florence, in, in, in Santo Spirito, where there are lots of six or so um, um, altarpiece frames have all got this, this um, contraption for a rail so that you can veil an image um, for the week before Easter, I, I suppose. Um, and, 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 but I think it wasn't, this would not have been a curtain like, like the curtain in those Dutch pictures, which is a no, permanent no. curtain. I think this would really be something where you just um, put a piece of cloth over a little bit, coincidentally, a little bit like the background of, 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 of our Madonna and Child, where, where the curtain hangs in midair, um, draped across a rod. Um, and actually, curiously, those, those uh, red bits of string holding the curtain almost suggestively end up at, 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 at our um, curtain devices on, on the frame or go towards that direction, which is beautiful um, and very subtle and probably rarely notice uh, um, uh, circumstance. And this is an example of, a, of, a, of an early frame that you've been able to purchase and not reunite, but, but apply to a contemporary painting, a contemporary picture at the gallery. Yes, yeah, so since I've been at the gallery, I've reframed many paintings and learned a lot through doing it and found many frames which I think were, were beneficial, like in this case, the narrow, a narrow original 15th century frame and, and, and put it on, a, on, a, uh, on, on this pure allegorical figure and I think profoundly changing what, what you see when you look at the painting. The frame on the left hand side was made I think in the early 20th century, late 19th century, um, with a view as, of almost competing with the ornament in the painting. So, so this kind of really extraordinary swirling ornament is taken up in the frame, in a frame of a kind of Venetian type of mystery. Um, uh, but it's, but it, but, but it, because of this um, overspilling of the, of, of, the, of, the, of the painting into the frame, the whole thing is almost impossible to read, whereas, whereas yes. the narrow frame makes the, 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 the figure much more sculptural and tames and contains the, 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 the ornament and actually makes it more the, the, the extraordinary ornamental, the, this dolphin coming out and, and all these really amazing um, tour creations become much more legible mm. and, and, and more defined. As you say, they're, not, they're no longer competing. And I think that's the case with a, a whole roster of paintings that you've reframed for the gallery. Well, Here that's, well, that's, and, that's and, what I try to do. But on the other hand, of course, um, yeah, this, this is a very beautiful, um, um, I think, very successful example of a stunning Venetian pastilla frame. Um, these are the frames typical for Venice and typical for the early 16th century, um, um, and almost exactly fitting. For, for this unusual Titian portrait. And, and, and it, you can see that the frame on the right, the new frame is, is, is much shallower. It, the way it's worn, because at the bottom it's worn through to the gesso, which, which, which by coincidence um, works really well with the marble, with, with the marble of that marble bust. Yes. But, and also the flatness of the frame and the flatness of the, of, of the marble and the flatness of the background gives all the volume to the figure of, of, of the woman standing there. Whereas yes. the frame on the left really competes in volume and, 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 and sacks the volume out of the, 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 the image in my mind. That's, 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 that's one, something that um, gives me great joy to see. Peter, I I hate to do this, but we've only got nine minutes before we lose everyone. Uh, but, no, these, but these are, in a way, these are kind of um, things that I do. But but on the other hand, they are they are 
um, they're not as important as original frames. Um, so so uh, this we included because it's an example of a walnut frame and, and you explained to us earlier how rare walnut frames of this period are. Yes, and this is this is a, a proper carved, quite a quite a to me a, a quite a mercantile frame. Whereas if you want a, a gilded frame, um, like the frame on the left, is it's, it's, it's a early twentieth century, late nineteenth century frame, um, but emulating a, a, an Italian seventeenth century frame. Yes. Whereas the frame on the right is an early sixteenth century, um, quite kind of strong and 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 and. Um, Compact frame, mm. which I think so it, it really serves this, this sort of mercantile portrait really well and fit it exactly. So, so the way we find frames is when we're looking for frames first, and then I, 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 I see if we've got the right painting for this frame. And doing it that way around, we quite often come up with very good solutions and of the right size. This is also interesting. You can see the uh, Mantegna, Samson, Delilah on the left, previously framed in, I think, the 1950s to 70s, in a typical 1950s, 70s frame, treat, it, 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 it treats the painting like a drawing. Mm. Because it's black and white, it kind of makes sense, but it, it even creates kind of created a gray passport two and then an outer frame. So it really yeah. looks like a drawing, whereas, whereas, of course, it is an imitation marble where, where Mantegna wants to give us the illusion of a piece of carved marble. Yes. Um, and the frame on the right, was a is the most beautiful early 16th, maybe even late 15th century um, walnut molding, which when you know about wood carving, and in this image you can't really see, but there's an innermost um, edge after the after the carved um, repeat carving, it's, that's quite obviously there's an innermost edge that's got a leaf carved on it, but the leaf is incised in a way that that really you only see in stone carving. Mm. And and that makes me think, and also there's an, on the outer molding, which also in this image you can see a little bit on the right hand side. There's also the same leaf, which is not. This is simply not carved like you would carve wood. It is wood carving in imitation of stone carving, um, which uh, which made me think that this is really is the perfect frame for for, for a painting that's imitating um, stone carving in the painting to have a, a wooden frame that is carved like a stone frame. Yes. I mean, we've been looking at things that try and um, compact, refine, recede, um, where the frame is taking second place to, or, or is more in harmony with the painting and is, is, is trying, trying less to shout. And actually, you've also not gone in the opposite direction, but you've, you've adjusted or, or reframed works in the collection at the National Gallery to include greater ornament, to, to almost shout louder, but they have this, the, inc incredibly, they have this effect that they they recede as well. Yes, yeah, so we have we have a number of these on, on the left of the former frame of the um, Madonna of the Rocks um, of a type that the National Gallery was a leading institution in the 19th century in, in framing Renaissance paintings in Renaissance frames. So we have a long history of, of, of trying to put paintings into um, the, the originals around. But in the 19th century, it was done by making things. And, and weirdly, the lack of the, the most disturbing parts is, is are the, the bits where there isn't any ornament, the gray piece at the bottom, and, and even more noticeably, the, 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 those, um, the two spandrels. Uh, those two um, corners. Uh, yes, the spandrels. The, oh, the, span, the spandrels, yes. Um, Whereas on the right hand side, we, 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 we made a frame partly, we were very lucky and fortuitous to find an original, parts of an original early, 16, early late 15th century um, Al Antica tabernacle frame. And we combined that with other elements, which we'll show in a moment. But the overall effect of more ornament is actually that the ornament is, is less disturbing, it, it mm. recedes much more. Um, effectively, and, and the painting comes through. And actually, the whole frame is shallower than the nineteenth-century frame. So the whole effect is is actually of one of of an appropriate but uh, um, appropriately uh, stepping back ornament. Yes. 
And sure. you, you, you base this on actual um, altarpieces still in situ that survive from the same frame makers or from the same carpenters who are working with Leonardo. And, and who made the frame for our Madonna of the Rocks. The original yeah. frame was made by the Damaino workshop. And, and, and in, in the, was, it was originally in uh, a setting like that example for, for, from, mm. uh, from Ponte and Valtellina. Um, so, so our Madonna would have been surrounded by either carvings or other, other panels of paintings. And, and you can see that the spandrels are taken from the spandrels. They're quite hard to see in this miniaturization, but there are spandrels next to that um, Madonna in, in, in the, the central niche. Yes. Um, and then, and then the ornament, that the predella ornament, is taken from the from the from the middle tier predella. From the, from that, that is um, uh, was the inspiration for our ornament at that point. And even those roundels without anything, <laughs> those empty roundels we took from from parts of the frame. And at the bottom, there are saints um, sticking out of this point, but at the top, you can see there are also roundels which, which don't appear to have anything um, inside yeah, them. Of course. So every element and 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 the the guillotine going surrounding as well as um, is, is taken from the from the, um, from, the column, yeah. from the upper column. So 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 we were lucky. We were lucky. I mean, it. Was, it I bought the pieces of frame first because they came up at auction and one has to come back quickly and, and that's found out afterwards how well they suited that moment and, 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 and Leonardo's work. And, and this happens again with the Sebastiano and now we are getting towards the very final um, slides in the presentation. So I, I do hope everyone can stick with us for the next couple of minutes. This very quickly is um, another example where you, where you did the same, where you're not just making it up as you go along far from it you are looking at original sections of the frame that survive in stitch in situ still yeah the, the predella of, of, of for, for 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 our sebastian Piombo's raising of lazarus um was found behind some cladding in the i think early 80s in, in Narbonne, and the cathedral was identified in the early 80s it was it was covered uh, the, the painting was sold to the duke to the duke d'orleans in the early seven uh, in the early 18th century and and replaced by a by a copy of this painting by Van Loo in an 18th century frame and all of the original frames lost except for the predella which was just behind the 18th century frame mm. um, and identified um, in the early 1980s. So we knew that the, that the predella looked like that and a predella like that would, would mean that the whole surround was substantial, yes. that it was an edicular frame like this, an Alantica frame, mm -hmm. and and right from from when I first came to the gallery, I was aware of this of this piece, and 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 I speculated what a whole frame would look like, but it seemed it seemed an impossible task to 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 to, to take on until but, this happened. But, but at the at the same auction actually, where we bought the pieces for the for the Madonna of the Rocks, we also found a substantial, which in this photograph, this is actually the photograph of the sale catalog in Genoa. It looks small, but even that piece was, I think, four and a half meters long. And because of its size, you can see it was cut through um, at an angle just for, I think, for transportation and for and for for keeping. Mm -hmm. um, and we bought this very inexpensively at the same auction, really speculatively at that moment, because even then it seemed it seemed only an outside a possibility that we would really make such a big tabernacle frame. Um, and then we made it for the. 500th anniversary of the um, commissioning of this of, 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 of the painting um, for, and, and to coincide with the Sebastian Michelangelo exhibition. And there is even a, a, a you can go, I think there's another picture where, where they we can see the entire frame. Oh, no, I, I have to go back. Uh, maybe there, there, the um, last surprise. Um, there's, <laughs> there's, there's even a quote by by, by Sebastiano um, saying in a letter to Michelangelo. That, that he wanted Michelangelo's help in, in, in ensuring that the painting, because the painting was going to be shown in, in Rome first before it was then sent to, to Narbonne, and it was going to be shown um, in, it was in, in competition with, with Raphael's um, transfiguration. Um, um, and, and, um, and he writes in a letter to Michelangelo asking Michelangelo's help 
to make sure that the painting was going to be framed when it was shown in Rome. And he says, for it, my painting will look better closed than if shown naked. And, and, and so even outside the church context, the frame was important for the artist. And I think what happens to the painting in the proper frame is really profound. And also in, in the room, it looks much more legible. The yeah. size of the figures become much more um, visually, much more, um, uh, much softer. Mm -hmm. with, that, with, with the narrow molding frame you can see on, this, on, on the right, Christ and Lazarus just overwhelm everything else. Whereas this frame brings them down to scale and, and little, lets us yes. see the, the depths of the painting and the whole the, the whole um, um, scene becomes much more a bustling scene and the scene of many figures and not just the scene of two really, really large ones in my mind. I think this is doing something that that many um, altarpieces connected to their altars um, would have done as well, which is to ground the figures that that in the the right hand image where with, with the earlier frame they are floating pr precipitously you know they are um they're, they're hanging over the the molding of the the room itself they are they're floating off of the earth and when you reframed it like this they, it grounds and connects the painting to the earth which is what which is where Lazarus is rising from anyway so that's, that's that's a very good observation yes that's, that's... Um, I will then, if I may, because it's just been so exciting for me to visit and look at, I'd just like to end this discussion. I really hope that everyone's still with us for another couple of minutes, just to look at a case study, which is the, the Titian posies, which um, have been put on as part of the National Gallery's exhibition at the moment. And as a fundamental part of that project, they were all reframed. And here we're showing them all in the frames in which they were exhibited by their host institutions before, and there are many different institutions who own these, these paintings. And um, they, this is a discord and disunity. And when you reframe them at the gallery, and the, I would implore everybody to watch the uh, YouTube video that we've shared that Peter um, worked on, um, and it's on our London Art Week website, which shows Actually, you you mentioned that you you carved over fifty meters of mouldings. Not me personally, but I worked with with, <laughs> no. with, 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 with Francois who carved most of the mouldings. Um, yes, it's it's almost fifty meters of fully carved, several um, lines of ornament. Um, that there's really an extraordinary effort to, to go to for a temporary exhibition. But I think with a profound effect on on we've we've at the gallery we've, we've previously brought paintings together that once belonged together, that were once part of the same room, the same installation. But when they come from different institutions, it's very hard to get a, just a sense of them belonging together. And I think that was worth all the effort, I think, to, 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 to create that. And, and, and as a model, we used um, the, the, what I think the original frame for, for, for Titian's very late Pieta at the Academ Academia in, 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 um, in Venice which I think has retained its original frame. It is quite difficult to, 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 to um, theoretically, because the painting was destined for, for, for one place and then not delivered there. And in the end, it, it was still in Titian's studio. Um, but the frame is contemporary as far as I can see. It hasn't been adapted in size. It's of such an incredibly enormous scale that it seems unlikely that it would have kind of come from somewhere else. So I think just by observing the frame, um, it seems very likely to me that it is the original frame and one of very few uh, petitions that have retained their original frames or a possible original frame. Um, this, this frame is, the original is 42 centimeters wide, so we've scaled it down to, I think, 26 centimeters for, for our paintings, which are much, much smaller. And they have this effect of unifying the group don't they, of, of bringing the scenes together and you feel that you are walking through the narrative. And also possibly to many people, it makes them invisible that they, that they are all the same. So you don't have to worry about the frames. You yeah. can really concentrate on the paintings, which is also an intention. I think that's crucial, isn't it? And of course you use the same principle to create difference. And so this is a shot that I took um, when visiting the, the show. And it's interesting because the posies, the, the, this group of five paintings have an identical mouldings, 
but a difference is created with the one, the National Gallery's later Death of Actian, um, which is is framed in a in a very different type of moulding. And you actually had some really um, interesting thoughts on the the kind of function of this image as the final one in the sequence and why you might frame it in this way. I mean, th th this frame is probably the frame that had the paintings remained in in Venice and if they had been put into a Venetian palazzo, that is a distinct possibility, that kind of frame, because it is really a wall molding. It is really, it is really a, 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 when we bought the frame, it, it, it didn't have a rebate. So this is a frame that was applied onto, on, a, on a wall for, for a painting that was set into the wall. So, so, so it is, and it is imaginable that the paintings would have been set into a wall and into a, into surrounding framing elements like this. Mm -hmm. um, in the context of the exhibition, I think it's the frame that looks, that is most final in its design and it's almost tombstone-like, whereas the other, the other frames have got, with the ornament, it is a, it is a, a following, flowing, a, a continuous ornament for stories which are continuing, whereas um, the death of Action is the only part of all of these um, stories which is completely final and irreversible. Um, you talk about this continuous molding, which is such an it's such an interesting aspect of it. Also, because there's a lot of water in the paintings, there's this sense of flowing and continuity throughout them all, but also a preciousness, a, a, this almost cushioning of gold, which is nowhere more um, uh, kind of uh, apparent than in the opening painting in the in the group here yes but the, the pro problem with that of course is that it's been cut at the top and therefore of course of course <laughs> this is me reading too much into things um but i i love what you've what you've done and i i should at this point i should have said it at the beginning but i'll say it now that um frames involve multiple craftspeople of course this is this is not not just a, a carver or, or a a sculptor, but also a painter, a gilder, um, can be working on frames in together. This, in, this, in this case, the gilding and finishing is really the crucial. Absolutely. That makes the frames look right and 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 in harmony with the paintings. Um, if we left these frames freshly gilded, um, they would look terribly at odds with with, with 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 old paintings, especially in the kind of lighting that that, that we use in the gallery. So so. The, the, the skill and we, we are very lucky in London. London is one of the centers for, 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 for reproduction frame making and, and has the history of the last 50 or 60 years of pe people making incredibly realistic um, copies of old surfaces. And we're working with Amanda Dixon, who, who, is, who is a very um, gifted specialist in, in, in the creation of real looking surfaces. And it, that's really a, it's an artistic process. It, it, it goes through all kinds of, in, in the film, it shows a little bit, it goes through lots of stages. Yeah. And actually, if you look closely, none of the frames are alike because of the scale, we didn't have the luxury to finishing all, them all at the same time. So they were finished at different times, so they're all slightly different, which I think adds to the, to the authentic look of them. Oh, I'm sorry, I closed that before I should have, but I hope I'm still screen sharing. Um, I wanted to, um, uh, at this point, say that, uh, and this is the end of our, our slideshow, and I'm really grateful that everybody has stayed with us, um, that there are some really useful online resources now, and we are pretending to be hip and with it by just giving you some online uh, links, but I, these are all really um, important and interesting sources of information for frames. The first one, the frame blog, I hope most people know, but it's, it, it has contributions by you, Peter, and many others on um, the subject of historic frames, which is kind of curated and brought together and populated by Lynn Roberts, to whom we're also very grateful for sharing some of her images. But I also, if, if people are interested in early frames, I, um, I, I think you should um, look at the two uh, second links here. The Kikurpa frames is, um, 
a really important uh, recent publication by Helene Verugstrater from 2015, which is fully accessible online and interactive, and you can see historic frames and how they are constructed, front, back, sideways, every which way. Also, it's one of, one, of, one of the few really in-depth academic studies of, of a group of picture frames. And um, the Closer to Van Eyck website, which um, is a personal favourite, it's almost bedtime reading, but it's really just like, like um, looking at beautiful images. But again, there are some fantastic images on that website um, for uh, looking at Van Eyck's particularly, obviously, but as, um, as objects. So you can see obje uh, photographs of the backs of the frames and you can really zoom in and see the details. So those are all really useful to um, to look at. I would like to end the discussion now and say thank you so much to you, Peter, for, for co-hosting this with me and for your time. Um, and I should also point out to those who are still with us, I'm very sorry that we've run on a little, but I wanted to say that um, you should tune in over the next couple of weeks because there will be three really important talks that are uh, coming up. The, the, the next one is on Wednesday, the 14th of October um, at 4.30 p.m. And it's on the subject, 500 years of women artists and a, a group of London Art Week um, uh, participating gallerists and others will look together at how our perception of women artists has changed over time and how we're finally beginning to champion them. And then on the Thursday, the 15th of October at again, 4.30, Per Rumbert, curator at the Royal Academy, will be in con conversation with Lucy Chiswell, who's the Dorset Curatorial Fellow for Paintings between 1600 and 1800 at the NG, on the subject of two celebrated female painters, Artemisia Gentileschi and Angelica Kaufman. And finally, on Wednesday, the 21st of October at 4.30, um, the talk entitled So Eminently a Classic Genius, the British sculptor Anne Seymour Damer will take place um, between Sylvia Davoli, curator at Strawberry Hill House and research associate at University of Oxford, Elise Nelson, assistant curator of European Sculpture and Decorative Arts at the Met, and Emanuela Terizzo, gallery director of Tommaso Brothers Fine Art, who will be exploring the work of Anne Seymour Damer. Uh, who exhibited at the, the RA and enjoyed the patronage, among others, of Horace Walpole. Now, um, that's a plug for London Art Week because it's so fantastic, but um, I wanted to, if I can, stop the share now and um, just if there are some questions, I think there are a few questions for us that I would really um, like to put to Peter. Um, can you recommend any books currently in print? Oh, books and frames is very, very difficult. I mean, my, my personal favorite is, 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 is a book from, from the early 20th century by, by Elfried Bock on, on, um, on Venetian and Florentine picture frames, but that's been long out of print. Um, but that is a fantastic study of, um, uh, of and, and limited to Venetian and, and, and Florentine picture frames. Um, re more recent frame books, um, in print, um, there, there was a, a study, a, a book by Klaus Grimm um, from the 1970s, which is in the context of this, not too far out of print. Um, th that is a very useful overview um, um, for the subject. Uh, more recent, there, 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 um, there's of course the, the small guide to the frames of the National Gallery by Nicholas Penny. Um, that is that is uh, still in print. Um, that is a kind of a history of European picture frames illustrated by examples in the National Gallery. And it might also be be useful, but it doesn't really go in. It's not the format to go into into great depth. Um, the, the literature frames is 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 um, because of the lack of academic interest. I think it, it, it's 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 it's. There are so there isn't a, a, a great work that I could recommend. I think. Um, there's another question here from Leah, who says, "What was the purpose of the painting covers, like the one that you mentioned with the Lotto painting?" Well, we went into some depth about that, um, about how it had a it could have a symbolic function to do with the message that's in the painting, but also as I, as I guess a protective. 
covering as well would would I'm not so sure because since if the cover was painted and and painted as by the by by the same artist by the same artist <laughs> it, seems, it seems unlikely I mean, occasionally I think a cover that is that is um, a coat of arms might have been a protective cover um, but a, a cover like the one on the lotto painting I think it was it wasn't really a, to protect I think it was to to enrich and and to to uh, to just create an intellectual spectacle. And um, the, the, a slightly more difficult question that has varied answers, I think, did some of the paintings that you reframed at the National Gallery also, as part of that process, undergo some other type of conservation? Not necessarily, but, but conservation treatments are often a, a reason for, 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 for reconsidering the frame, partly because the painting is out of the frame for conservation, but also because some conservation interventions, like the recently um, uh, restored large um, uh, Van Dyck equestrian portrait of Charles I, it changed size in conservation because there were additions on the painting which were removed, and 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 therefore the size was different. So the reframing that comes reframing, but not every reframing um, goes hand in hand with 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 with, with a painting conservation. Um, is there any meaning attached to the thickness of a frame, or I guess the size? I mean, we we didn't really uh, discuss proportion and scale so much as we perhaps we should and could have. That's yeah, that's but, one aspect of it. But but almost the working with paintings and frames, one lesson is th there are no rules, or there aren't. There isn't really can't. That's why we wanted to show both big frames and narrow frames, just to show that. That that it's that there isn't really um and, and the evidence of in the historical frames that one finds one often finds very wide small frames in very narrow large frames and the purposes for frames vary so much in where they were placed how they interact with the paintings I think there isn't really a rule. Um, there's a question here that I. I really uh, I'm grateful for Eric. How do we advance the issue of showing paintings with their frames in printed and online publications, especially those that we've pointed out retain their original frames? Well, that that thank you, Eric, for pointing that out because that is actually one of the key um, reasons for organising this talk. That actually we should be paying more attention to the frames, and as art historians, we have a job to to do that. And so you're right to ask the question and. We should all keep asking it of art historians <laughs> and anyone who else who publishes paintings certainly yes yes but it's been it's been a quest for as long as i've been involved in painting <laughs> and, 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 and the advances are um hesitant at best um peter this is something that you might be able to answer are the institutions who um own the titians all planning to keep the the new frames do you know well, our frame, our paintings, which are shared with the National Gallery in Scotland, will, as far as I know, remain in those frames, and they were intended. And the frames were intended as the new permanent frames. Um, other other participants in this have greater difficulties of integrating these frames, even even those like like the um, uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, who were very keen on the frame, who also paid partly for the frames. I think. For their installation, it would be difficult to change the frame because the frame is part of the Isabella Stewart Gardner interior and it hangs above a table or a sideboard and some chairs, and, and the frame is kind of part of that of that situation. So I think there it will probably be kept as a as an exhibition frame, possibly. Um I I think the Prado might want to keep that frame. I'm, 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 they're certainly welcome to it, and 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 I think from my point of view, it would be a an improvement on the on, on the previous frame, and, but the same in the similar situation with the interiors uh, for the Wallace collection, where um, the, the the frames are all nineteenth century or eighteenth century French or nineteenth century and eighteenth century French style. For them to have a, a, a an early or a sixteenth century frame on a sixteenth century painting might also look out of place, and I think they're. At least, so as far as I know, they're not going to keep the frame, and I think even more so for the for, for the for the for the for the for the Duke of Wellington picture, um, which is a fragment, and that is completely where it hangs. It is completely surrounded by French frames, and and has got a French set frame. So I think that'll 
probably get, go back into that. Um, there's a question from Cynthia um, who asks what the purpose is of the curtain. Is it just to protect it from light? Now we went into, um, we didn't really go into much depth about it, but you mentioned that some of um, some some curtains were used as lantern hangings, um, and others were used as as part of a performance of 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 viewing um, and and enjoying the painting or the picture, perhaps with friends. I, I think it's an attempt to make uh, make make almost moving images to make in, in the absence of film and television it is a, it is a it is some some way of bringing something to life and, and, and yes. creating something surprising and something that you can perform you know, beyond to just looking at um i th i think we should round um we should round this off and draw it to a close because we have eaten into everybody's dinner time <laughs> including yours peter so i'm very grateful thank you everybody who's asked questions and who has joined us for this um first london art week art history and focus talk please do um look out for more uh, in the coming two weeks these those three i mentioned but there will be more throughout the year as the london art week website continues to be populated by its participating galleries and um and its friends and uh, collaborators like you Peter so thank you um, and thank you everybody for joining in I'm going to say good night to everybody thank you Matthew for including me of course bye, -bye. speak to you bye